As we thought about our non-negotiables, we could think of no better way to open this annual meeting than by inviting the three distinguished gentlemen who sit before you. With more than 100 years of leadership and service to philanthropy, as practitioners, scholars, advisors, and trustees, Dr. Joel Fleischman, Tom Kearney, and Tom Lambert embody the best of who we are and who we can be. Dr. Fleischman is the author of The Foundation, The Great American Secret. He is also the professor of law and public policy and the director of the Heyman Center for Ethics, Public Policy, and the Professions at Duke University. He is a lovely and kind man, and he has served our field so well for so long. Tom Tierney is the founder and the chairman of the Bridge Fan Group. And with Dr. Fleischman as the author of Give Smart, Philanthropy That Gets Results. And finally, Tom Lambert is the senior fellow at the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation in North Carolina, where he served as executive director from 1978 to 2001. It is truly my great pleasure and honor to turn the stage over to these fine and distinguished gentlemen and to ask Mr. Lambis to set the table for a conversation that will inspire and sustain us. Foundations, which I've long admired, 
but I think of it as, as the most active, the longest lived, and the largest of the regional associations of grant makers anywhere in the country. Uh, and the kind of video we just saw illustrates the way in which you all are forward-looking, forward-moving, forward-thinking, forward-acting, and forward-transforming. And that's all really just, uh, it, it, it's inspiring because, you know, when, I think, when we all are involved in foundations in one way or the other, uh, and the, the inspiration that we get from talking to one another and challenging one another and trying to move the sector forward just sheds countless benefits on the beneficiaries of the foundations, all the nonprofits that you work with, and really does give you a chance to have fun. And so it's clear we're having fun here today, and this whole program has been fun until now. And just, but we hope we'll make it, we hope we'll continue to make it fun. Um, it's a pleasure to work with Bob Hall, too, in the past. I remember it very well. This is, I think, the third time I've had the privilege of speaking uh, to the Southeast Council on Foundations, uh, and I have to say that my arrival at the airport this time was a lot less frenetic and scary than it was when I spoke up at the Greenbrier. And if those of you who have seen the Greenbrier Airport, you know exactly what I'm talking about. In any event, um, the question that Tom asked uh, is, has a, a sort of a history to it. Uh, and the reason we wrote the book Gift Smart is because Tom Tierney came to me one day and he said, Joel, he said, you know, you've been writing about foundations for a long time. You've got something, you know, something about the history of the foundations in the United States. We at Bridgespan have been working on, working with foundations and nonprofits for the last 10 or 11 years. Why don't we put together what we respectively learn into a book that might really be useful? to people who are trying to figure out how to give away their money in an effective, activist way. So it was really his idea. To, to it's not, no, wait, wait, it's not exactly, that's not exactly right. Excuse me, professor. Uh, there's, there's a little bit of a, a history here. You know, we've used the word the transform. Joel just used it, it was in the video. Uh, transform's a big word. It's a really big word. And I'll use it now uh, carefully to say that uh, Joel Fleischman and Atlantic Philanthropies, when Joel was president of the US portion of Atlantic Philanthropies, transformed my life. And that Bridgespan, this nonprofit organization with a couple hundred people and hundreds and hundreds of clients over 12 years of work, would not exist were it not for him. Now, he doesn't like to hear that because he's uh, humble and doesn't like to take credit. But the fact of the matter is, I was a chief executive running a very successful company, relatively young age, growing quickly, and I had this, if you will, call to service. It's one of those things where you start asking yourself what really matters in life. And I love business, I still love business, but the question that was nagging me was how can I be of service, more service to others? That question led me to Joel when he was at Atlantic, that interaction in this anonymous building behind this anonymous facade, Atlantic was anonymous at the time, led to a business plan, led to Joel uh, for three years, helping me put together a board, raise the money, uh, support me in leaving this 2,000 plus person organization with offices around the world where it was a corner office, lots of benefits, leaving that to start a charity. To start a charity, no pay, three people, hopefully in service of others. He not only gave me money, he gave me courage. And that has been transformative. And part of the reason I went to his office that day at Duke was to close that circle. To say, Joel, you are the wisest, most experienced person in philanthropy I've ever known. You helped create an organization and change not my life only, but many, many, many others directly and indirectly. How about if we collaborate in service? of society once again. So that's the other story that Professor Fleischman won't necessarily well, you talk about. Too much credit. I mean, See? This is how it is. <laughs> well, it's the truth. The truth of the matter is that I arrived at Atlantic Philanthropies. We had a great chairman of the organization who cared deeply about foundations and nonprofits and the fact that they are they underperform their institutions that chronically underperform for lots of reasons that we'll talk about in a little bit later, 
Uh, and so they were really disposed to looking at what could we do as a foundation that might make a significant difference in the world of, of foundations and nonprofits. And so all I, it just happened to be my good luck to be there at the time that we, we were able to do that. So, you know, and the rest in a way is history because the, the, the essential idea that Tom had and we wanted to support was there needed to be a, a utility basically for nonprofits and foundations that could provide strategic consulting management advice to nonprofits of the same level of quality that Bain and Company, which is where he, which he headed before, and McKinsey and other, other major consultancies were providing routinely to for-profit corporations at the highest level. And Tom and the team he, he assembled managed to do that successfully. And in a sense, a lot of what we are talking about, and you've seen it already, it's not just the book that we wrote, it's, the, it's what Bridgespan has done in setting, raising the bar higher than it's ever been raised before in this country for the, the quality of decision-making advice and strategic management advice that is now available routinely, not, not only through direct client relations with Bridgespan, but with the publications. If you follow the, the publications that they've done, you'll know what I'm talking about because they, they're dealing with all the problems that they can deal with on the basis of the data that they got from the, the client relations and making it available to the whole world of philanthropy in the United States. All right, now, 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 now. So, we won't talk about it anymore? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, one of the most amazing aspects of the journey that, that Joel and I have been on around Give Smart was we combined his experiences, my experiences, Rich Spence, et cetera, and lots of other people's ideas dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, additional interviews. And in that process, of course, one learns. And one of the things that came into acute focus for us was how hard it is, how incredibly hard it is to succeed in philanthropy. There's lots of reasons for that. But the implication, which we wrote about in the book, was picked up very early on is that, quote, the natural state of philanthropy is underperformance. Underperformance. What does that mean? That means we, we, could do better. How does that, why? What's going on? Well, first of all, the problems we're wrestling with are really hard problems. Secondly, the feedback loops, the way you learn, are distorted because when you give away money, people tend to say nice things to you, at least directly. Third, you're almost always working with and through others. You're not doing it yourself. So for a variety of reasons, just the complexity of strategy. You know, I thought business was hard. Business is easy relative to changing communities, serving lives, solving social problems. It's easier to make a widget than to change a life. So it's really hard and despite all the good intentions of the world. We tend to accept the status quo at any point in time. We tend not to raise the bar on ourselves. So we say not only is the natural state of philanthropy under, perform uh, under performance, we say, with all due respect, excellence in this stuff is self-imposed. Nobody's gonna make you try harder. Nobody's gonna make you set a higher bar. We have to do that ourselves. And as we went through our research and writing project, that theme just came to the foreground that there's this enormous unlocked potential in philanthropy. And it's not just about giving money away, it's about solving social problems. That's, and it's not really about money. The truth of the matter is, it is about what you can do in addition to the money. Any of you who've been engaged in, start, in starting projects know that the money is, is it's important because you can't start the project without it, but it's not sufficient to get the job done. You've got to put yourself into it. You've got to go out and, and create networks, bring your networks to bear on, on, for, for the benefit of the nonprofits that you're providing money to. The really, the, the successful efforts, I bet, Tom, how much time did you spend 
we're working on problems with other philanthropies uh, and community people when you were trying to make grants to organizations in North Carolina? Well, as we got more into it, more time, but not a lot. You should have done more. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's Why didn't you tell me that then? <laughs> I didn't know as much then as I think I know now, and I realize now how little I still know. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that, 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 that the, when, you think, when you look at new initiatives, or you look at how to transform organizations, which is what one of the three reasons you're here today, um, to learn about how better to do that, you, can't, you cannot do it without giving your time. And, the, and we all know, if you, if those of you, everybody in this room works in a foundation, the job is so, is, is, it, it can be extremely fulfilling, but at the same time, you've got to figure out which, grant, which organizations you want to give money to. You've got to negotiate with those organizations to figure out what they're going to do with it when they come to you or whether you come to them. You've got to figure out how to, uh, how to figure out how to help them implement what they want to do. You've got, a, you've got a certain budget of money to spend. You want to get that spent. You don't want to be left. You don't want to have it left over. Uh, as Tom says, you know, the truth is, getting money out the door ends up being, for many foundations, the most important signal of success, whether they got the money out the door. But that's not the way you get results. You get results by doing all these other things that have very little to do with the amount of money you get out the door. It's the value added that you have, the distinctive value added that you have, that can bring things into creation. So I think it's really important to think about that as you think about your job. And so the reason you're overworked is, how do you get the money out the door? How do you, get, how do you build, bring your networks to bear? How do you follow up with what you've done to be sure that it is, that, that it is the best you can do? All the kinds of things to enable you to, that you have to do and it comes out of your own hive for all practical purposes because there are more things than any reasonable person can do, but if you don't do them, you really can't get the impact that you're trying to get. Right, imagine, it's 1958. John and Nell Dorr, John's an engineer, are driving down a road in New Jersey, it's late at night, pitch black, and the cars are, are coming on in the other lane, and they're swerving a little bit, that is, John and Nell are, because they can't quite see where the edge of the road is. And one of them, and we don't know who, but we're going to guess it was Nell, because she's on the outside, says, what if, there, what if there were a line or something on the edge of this road so we could see where the edge is before we go into the, into the dirt or under the shoulder? What if there were a line? Long story short, uh, John and Nell proposed uh, a test the New Jersey authorities, I think it was on the Merritt Parkway, to put a line, and it, it cost them a few hundred dollars a mile. Not a lot of money, even in those days. And they did a test, and in six months, accidents went down something like 50%. And then another test was done by another community, and another test was done by another community. It took them 10 years. But 10 years later, Having that little white line, or whatever it is, to the road became a national standard. Think of how many hundreds of thousands of lives have been saved, how many injuries avoided because of that innovation. Now that little story has a few morals to it. It wasn't about the few hundred thousand dollars John and Nell ended up spending. It was about the time and energy and influence and dedication and commitment they made. They were doing something that we refer to as fewer, bigger, longer. They were doing one thing. They weren't trying to get money out the door. They were trying to save lives. And they didn't do it alone. In this case, they did it with communities, with highway departments. It is also very interesting, Tom, that how much money did they spend over that 10-year period? Less than $100,000. Think about the cost-benefit ratio of that in terms of, of producing the, the saving of lives that occur as a result of it. So which the point being, you don't, it doesn't take an enormous amount of money to achieve impact. You can achieve impact with $1,000 if you think about how to do it strategically. 
So don't, it's important not to be deterred when you think about how to increase the impact of what you're doing, how to get the bigger, a bigger bang for the buck that you're spending. It's all in the thought process that you give to it and the amount of time you're willing to devote to implementing it. But let, let me just, of all things, interrupt the two of your conversation why, and why? ask you a question about that. <laughs> Suppose out in this audience um, there is a donor and also a staff member from the foundations which they have created. And having heard this really great story about the White Lines, they go back to wherever they come from in a few days. And the donor says to the staff member, get me one of those white line projects. What, what, would, you, what would you say to the staff member? What guidance would you give them? What would I say to them? I would say, you know, go out there and see what problems there are in the community that you can, in fact, make a significant difference on, move the needle on in a reasonable period of time, and tell me how much it's going to cost to do it. Uh, that's what I would do. I mean, it seems to me, you know, that's what the Cleveland Foundation did when it was being founded. The first thing it did was to take a look, a, a systematic look at what the problems of the community were, and they picked the areas they wanted to work in, and then they picked within the areas, they picked particular problems that could be solved, and then they developed strategies for them. Then they gathered data about what other people in other parts of the world were doing with respect to those same problems, and they came back and formulated the process. Yes. <laughs> I better say. I, of course, I, I can't, there, there are some patterns, and we don't write about these uh, quite explicitly in the book, but there are, there are patterns associated with generating higher impact. That doesn't mean they're always present, but they are generally present. One pattern we just described uh, is figure out what success is and work back from that. That sounds simple. It's actually not simple. Because if you can't define success in a way that you can judge progress against it, if you can't define success in a way that is a rational person would say, yeah, you might, you might achieve that. If you can't define success in that way, then you're either overreaching or you've, or you've fallen prey to kind of fuzzy-headedness. So that's a, a serious trap. So that, that definition of success is sometimes really complicated, sometimes really clear. White lines are really clear. Other things take climate change, really complicated. So definition of success matters a lot. The second pattern is just this obsessive, obsessive desire to push. You know, the book's organized in questions. The reason it's organized in questions is the pattern we saw around philanthropy that, that achieved incredible results is the donors and or the staff kept pushing the questions. Is that working? What's working? How can we do better? What's going on the committee? They're pushing questions. What is success and how will, be, how will it be achieved? What are we accountable for? How do we work with grantees? Pushing, pushing questions. Complacency is like cancer. Complacency is expensive. It will pervade an organization and if we're not careful, undermine results. So those are some patterns that I think you saw with Ned and with, uh, 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 with the doors, with John and Nell. You saw it in your situation. We saw that throughout where the organizations are just pushing for increased clarity, pushing for continuous improvement about whatever it is, the success they're trying to achieve. I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> the good news, collaborating with someone who's both smarter and wiser than you no. is a really good idea, most of the time. <laughs> um, in any event, we, we, you're all facing a lot of particular problems. Uh, and the one I think that, that we, Tom and I have talked about before you know, is basically the nonprofit starvation cycle, um, in which um, donors, and I hope that none of you in the room are guilty of this particular sin, are, are loath to provide the kind of support to foundations they need to operate as opposed to deliver on specific programs. In other words, capacity building. In other words, general operating support, those kinds of things. Foundations don't like, as a general rule, to give um, uh, op general operating support. They don't like, as a general rule, to give thorough, really badly needed
capacity of building support, yet how are the nonprofits that you're working with going to deliver good programs for you if they don't have the, the capacity in their staff, they're not, if they don't have the opportunity, the, the people to help them raise money, to build their boards, and so on. The, I, I was encouraged, we met with the CEO's group this morning here, and I think both of us were encouraged by the number of foundations that are in fact beginning now to give very significant um, support for, uh, for the kinds of things that would be called overhead. Tom, talk a second about the, about the difference between good overhead and bad overhead. Sure. Um, this is where my business background and the, the social sector kind of blend a little bit. In, in business, and most of you, all of you know this, you know, businesses are measured on their outputs, not their inputs, profit, return on equity, those sorts of things. In the social sector, because it's very, very complex to measure results, and in some cases almost impossible. There's a default position, which is let's measure inputs. So there have been organizations that third parties that, that rank nonprofits based on their overhead. This would be akin to ranking businesses based on their overhead. You know, I serve on eBay's board I have for a long time. I don't know what eBay's overhead is. I do know what its profit is and its earnings growth is. When you rank people on overhead or when you bring that mentality to one's philanthropy, you start making uh, false decisions because there is bad overhead, of course, if a, a nonprofit is uh, flagrant, is wasting money, uh, living extravagantly, and so forth. Uh, but there's much more, a much more common problem is a, an absence of funding good overhead. Most of what Bridgeman does is work downstream with nonprofit organizations supported by donors and foundations. Two thirds of what we do is, is downstream, mostly in human services, mostly serving disadvantaged populations. We very rarely see a nonprofit organization working in inner cities, working in tough communities that is fat and happy. You know, their trade offs are, you know, do they buy, you know, used furniture or really, really used furniture? They're not wasting money. In fact, it's not just the donor that's, that's starving the organization. Often it's the staff themselves because I can't tell you how many times I've heard, you know, if we had an incremental dollar, I want to go to the kids. I don't want to hire a COO. I don't want to hire a CFO. I've got a part-time bookkeeper. But these nonprofits tend to be strongly led and unmanaged. But if you're trying to generate impact, that management capacity is hugely important. So we have for whatever reason, across the sector, a default position that says all overhead is bad. We should try to minimize it. Government funding, of course, does this routinely. And the consequence of minimizing that overhead is we starve the organizations of their ability to deliver results. We make them short-sighted. They can't hire the best people. They can't build the right infrastructure. They don't have money to invest in technology. So we're penny-wise and pound foolish. And this has been well documented. By the way, there are a number of other pathologies or, or bad habits that extend from that. Really funny accounting, really, really funny accounting at the nonprofit level, where somebody that would otherwise be overhead is allocated to programs. That happens all the time. Because if you tell the true story, people say, oh, you've got too much overhead. Who pays to build the organization if they're delivering results? And for most of us as donors, we're no better than the organizations we give money to. We may be paying for the ball to play the game, but they're actually taking the ball and putting it through the hoop. So therefore, the implication is where it matters strategically in the context of portfolio, where capacity, downstream capacity, the organizations you're supporting really matters, you've got to step up to the plate and pay for more than the ball. That's a double metaphor, whatever. <laughs> One other just general pattern while we're, while we're on this, there is and has been over the last 15 years, at least that I've been involved in the social sector, enormous attention paid to strategy. And you know, gosh knows how many millions of PowerPoint slides have been generated around theories of change and theories of theories of change, and all these things, all of which are important. But another pattern that we saw throughout our research throughout British Man's experience and Joel's experience as well, was that execution matters more than strategy. It's about doing it 
and then reacting and learning from what you're doing. It's not about just thinking about it up front. That's why they call it a theory of change. It's a theory because we're not certain how it's going to work. What does that mean? As we learn, we have to adjust. The learning is in the doing. And if we can't learn when we're doing, we're going to underperform. Is that simple? So we tend to invest substantially in, if you will, getting the money out the door, creative strategies, compelling strategies. We tend to underinvest in grants management, in the kind of value added to the grantee, for example, that Joel did with Bridgespan, helping me put together a board, helping me find a law firm, helping me uh, recruit other people, helping me raise more money, helping me sort out things that I had no idea how to sort out. That was huge value added. And most grant makers today don't have the time and or are <laughs> under investing in that kind of downstream execution that at the end is going to determine whether or not things succeed. So you think about, we've talked about the natural state of nonprofits, and particularly foundations, as being um, uh, a, 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 a situation in which there aren't any market forces there. Um, you know, you don't really, as, if you're in foundations, you make the decisions yourself, the board makes the decisions with you, um, but there are no market forces impinging on you that, is to, that, that, that drive you to try to be better at what you're doing. Which is, what, which is what leads us to the conclusion that we said earlier, that excellence is self-imposed. You can't do it. If, if you don't impose excellence on yourself, you're simply not going to be, you're not, there, there are no forces there that are going to encourage you to be excellent. That means that you're not going to get, try, get as much benefit out of, out of the money that you're spending, which is, after all, sacred dollars. And think about, just think about it for a minute. It's the only pool of money that's available for individuals to make a difference in improving the problems of society. The government, of course, spends a lot of money, but typically it's categorical. In the case of foundations, it's basically they're unclaimed, there are no claims on that money, you can do with it what you want. And how many pools of money are there in society which you can do with what you want to benefit society on an, ind an individual basis? Vol volunteer individual organizations doing those things out of the generosity of people who created the foundations in the first place. So it's, it's money that is, that, that is in, in a way, it's invaluable money. There's no other pool of money like that. And think, what the, think of the privilege it is for you all to be figuring out how to spend that money. So isn't there some obligation to try to impose excellence on yourself to be sure that you're getting the biggest bang for the buck? I think there is. And I think that in the time, for example, today, you know, one of the issues that, the new pre that President Obama is going to have to face in the campaign, in, in, in the election, is what to do about the tax deduction, or what to do about all the other tax expenditures. It's not the largest tax expenditure. Yeah, sure. I'm going to ask you a question related to it, but I'm also not unaware of the fact that I'm supposed to conclude this in a matter of several minutes. What time, um, how much time do we have left? Well, if we stick to the... Uh, Schedule. We don't have five minutes, but, but we may run over a little bit. Well, we didn't start until We like started a little bit late. <laughs> okay, Tom. Okay, Joel. We're going we're gonna to be okay. Uh, let me ask you a question that's a little bit related to that and then give folks a chance to ask. And I know that each of you likes to have a minute or so for closing. <laughs> and this is a little bit related to what you just said. We've got someone who's been involved in a major a corporate entity, people, somebody who's been involved in a very large uh, philanthropic uh, one, and, and both of you have uh, interviewed either formally or informally a lot of people who are in the donor world. I know all of you being uh, historians of uh, the, the country and philanthropy realize that next year is the centennial of the ratification of the 16th Amendment, which created the income tax. We are in a state, by the way, which was so eager to ratify that it was a third in a matter of several months to ratify our Joel's mind native state being a place of sober second thought. It was only 20th it took us a while in North Carolina to decide what to do. If there were no income tax, if it were to disappear uh, soon, um, would we still have those donors 
you all have, have worked with and you have interviewed, um, would, would philanthropy begin to go away? Can I refine your question? You, you, you can do whatever you want. No, no. <laughs> It's not the income tax, it's the tax deduction that is, yeah. that is the issue, which is, I think, I think, I get, I get so few opportunities to correct Tom, that, 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 but I thought that's what he, where he was going. In any event, the answer is, I think, yes. Remember, we had gifts, a lot of the first foundations were established without any tax benefit. There wasn't, there wasn't a tax income tax, and there wasn't a tax deduction whenever the first foundations were created in this country. Chuck Feeney, who gave them what ended up being about $6 billion to create Atlantic Philanthropies, got no tax deduction for it. It was set up not as an American foundation and he couldn't get a deduction for it. So the answer is the empirical data suggests that people will give money to philanthropy whether there is a tax benefit or not. The tax benefit does make a difference with respect to the amount of money they give, but in terms of whether they actually give money or not, People don't do it. Listen, two-thirds of the taxpayers in this country don't get a deduction for the money that they give as it is because they're non, they don't itemize their deductions. They take the general they take the general standard deduction and not itemizing it. So I think the economists agree that people would certainly continue to give without the tax deduction. It, there would be a decline at the beginning in the amount of money they give, but it would build up back up again. Uh, I think I partially agree and partially disagree. Uh, so here's, here's uh, a couple of points. First of all, uh, culture, the culture of a company, culture of a country, I'll define as how we do things around here. It's how we do things around here. And America has a culture of generosity, has a culture of lending a hand, has a, a culture of supporting our communities. It goes way back to before we were even a country. We had no other choice. There was no government. We had to do it on our own. You asked your neighbor. We have a culture of giving that is in part driven by the tax cycle. So I don't know how all of you folks work, but you know, the way my wife and I work on our giving, we have a couple things we know we're going to give to, but then we'll have all the solicitations. Sometime in December, we sit down because we've got to do it in December and kind of sort through everything and figure out what our giving is going to be. If there were no tax implications, we would not sit down in December. We'd just say, oh, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. So I do think there is a timing question. The countervailing force of, on that is we just, we bridge span with support from Joel. I uh, just finished an amazing series of video interviews, which will go online in about two weeks. Uh, we're calling it the Remarkable Givers. We took nominations, and these are high net worth people. So these are not you know, the typical folks. These are high net worth people. We had three or four hundred nominations. We chose 50. Virtually everyone says yes. It ranges from Bernie Marcus and Julian Robertson to Mike Milton and Melinda Gates. Amazing. We interviewed them for an hour and a half to two hours each. I'm off camera asking 50, 60, 70 questions. And many of those questions are how are you going to involve your family? How do you think about a foundation in perpetuity? Are you inclined to give while you live? That question of how they're thinking about their wealth. Each of those interviews, we extract 25 to 30 YouTube-sized videos, 30 seconds, 90 seconds, which we're then tagging multiple ways, and we'll start rolling out online in mid-December as a learning tool. So the world can find out how other people, very, very wealthy people with tons of money, are thinking. One of the pervasive themes from at least the 37 interviews that I personally did was major donors not creating foundations in perpetuity, either sunsetting or trying as hard as they can to give while they live. Tasha and John Margrave, John was CEO of Cisco, said we're trying to die broke. Now their timing is a little bit tricky to figure that thing out, <laughs> but that's what they're trying to do. With rare exceptions, did we find anyone who said, I really am kind of holding on to all the wealth I'm gonna create it for the next you know, generations after generations. It was a default position. If I can't give away while I'm alive, my ears will have to figure it out, and they're going to have to do it within 30 years. And that's the second important variable. There's an old Irish saying, there are no pockets and shrouds. There are no pockets and shrouds. And that money only goes a couple of places. It's not going to go with you. It's going to go to your kids, or it's, or it's going to go to society, or it's going to go to government. 
Clark, you figured that out a long time ago and wrote about it at Gospel of Wealth. It looks like the trend, and I know Joel and I fully agree on this, the trend is toward far more robust giving while living, fewer foundations in perpetuity. That's a countervailing force. So I would say if the tax law changes, there will be a decline, a structural decline in giving. Some of the people, for example, if there's no benefit when they sell their company, aren't going to put you know, the appreciated assets in a Fidelity charitable gift fund. There are no benefits to that. So what they might do is they'll get around to giving, but it is common for people to delay those things because it's a confrontation of immortality and so on and so forth. So I think it would dis disrupt the timing, but I also think that the wealth transfer that's going to occur over the next 20 years in this country is historic. It's utterly historic. It's the baby boom generation, the wealthiest generation in the history of mankind, passing on, and some of its predecessors passing on and leaving that wealth behind in a way that's never occurred during their lifetimes, during the lifetime of that gen particular generation. So I'm not an economist, but I, I do think there's some behavioral things that might temper it. Let me just, let me just, right, sorry. Let me just Nobody is thinking at this point that the charitable tax deduction is going to be abolished. And certainly, as a matter of principle, I think the tax deduction is a great benefit because it does increase the money coming in to some degree, at least, in any event. So the point is, Will, will there likely be some kind of a reduction in the value of the tax deduction? You know, it's key, it's key to marginal tax brackets. That's really what makes, that's how it works, essentially. It diminishes the cost to you of the gift depending on your tax bracket. So the question really is, should we do it? My point is very simple. We have a horrific problem with the federal budget. And if there has to be, I'm, while I want to see this tax, the tax the deduction continue, while if, we have, if we're going to have a grand bargain to reduce some of the tax expenditures, and mind you, the tax deduction is the least costly to the federal government of the, all the other deductions. The biggest one is the non-taxability of, of employer-provided health, which is something like $100 billion a year, uh, more than that, actually. The, whereas the, the, the tax deduction is less than a third of that cost to the federal government. And there are others, the home mortgage tax deduction is another one. So the long and the short of it is that I don't think anybody envisions that the tax deduction won't be here. I think people do envision if we have a grand bargain with respect to reduction of, 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 of the tax expenditures and cutting down of federal expenditures itself, I think we could have a, a reduction in it. But I don't think it would be egregious. Before the I do want there to be a chance that there are a, a couple of questions out there in the audience for them to be uh, posed. So if somebody has a question, if you will stand or raise your hand or something, somebody I'm sure will come to you with a mic. Is there a question from uh, right here? Professor, it seems that your premise is that the people aren't generous and the tax deduction doesn't help giving because it's so incidental in the amount of money that it prevents the government from collecting. So why not be in favor of getting rid of it and seeing if people do have generous hearts and do their giving while they're living so they're knowing where it's going. Instead of taxing their wealth at the end of their life and taking away what they earned and already paid taxes on. Well, the answer, the, the, I would, I would, you know, yeah, I know, I, I recognize that it was directed to me. The, um, the, um, the answer to the question is really very simple. We are extremely lucky in the, you, the Americans do give away, as a percentage of the GDP, something like over 2%. It's been anywhere between 2.3% is high and 1.7%, but in the last 20 years it's been at 2%. That is three times the percentage of, of GDP of money given away to charity in any other country in the world. The next nearest one is the UK with 7.7%. So the question is, we have built a nonprofit sector here 
with that degree of money given voluntarily by people with an incentive from the government. I, I think that, that I, don't, I don't want to tamper with it if unless it necessarily needs to be tampered with. I want to consider continue doing it that way, but, I, but as I said earlier, I don't, I, it seems to me very clear that we, sh that, that we may have to sacrifice some in it. So I'm not, I, I, don't want to, I don't want to take a big risk and try to say, let's do away with the tax deduction altogether, because I don't think, I don't think that, listen, why do we have it? We have it because of the fact that there are things that the, that the, that the public uh, would like to see happen in other countries that we don't see happen here. We don't give their er whole areas of nonprofit re revenues that other companies routinely give from the government. We believe it's much more important for Americans to be able to pick and choose the things that they give to rather than to have the government do it directly. And so we've left it to the government and the government says it's, it's good for society for individuals to make, to, get, to make gifts according to what their values are. That's the, what I think one of the great strengths in American society. There's a different issue between, as between the large donors who give out of necessity whether there is a tax benefit or not. John D. Rockefeller, when there wasn't a tax benefit at all to his giving, said, I can't think of how to spend my, all the money that I'm getting because it's going to ruin my kids if I give it to them, and I can't think of how to spend it to give me more pleasure. So he gave Bitten at what to today's funds billions of dollars away with no tax benefit. But there are many people in this country at the much lower levels of giving who would, who, for whom the tax benefit and tax incentive does make a difference and it proliferates the values of a wide variety of Americans that can do that, whether it's religion or whether it's arts or whether it's advocacy, things you couldn't support them otherwise. So I think that I do believe the tax benefit is important as an incentive, but I'm simply saying we may have to compromise on it. I apologize that I'm not going to have a chance to ask you more questions. So these two gentlemen, I'm sure, will stay around forever and answer your questions <laughs> off, off the stage if you want to do that. I'm told that you'd like to have concluding remarks, and we're about to be concluded. Well, you know, we by the service. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I did, did the best I could. But I, I actually retake my just I think you did a fabulous job. Yeah.